Okie dokie, you're set. Sorry, I got a... Hey, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay. Is it gone here? Um, as, a as a preliminary matter, this is Brian Sullivan, the chair of the Affordable Housing Trust. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are here, present, and can hear me. Brooke Moore? Present. Penny Dye? Uh, present. Christy Ferentella? Present. Steve Iverson? Present. I don't see Rima. Um, is, are we not planning on seeing her today? Or? She, was she was here. She was here. I think she was having technical difficulties. She'll probably okay. come back. She'd get better Wi Fi. Great. And Allison Mitchell. Here. Um, Eleanor, when I call your name, please <laughs> respond affirmative. I'm here. Okay. Go ahead. Um, thank you for being three people today, Eleanor. <laughs> Just bear with me if I need to do five things at once. Please just let us know. Okay. Uh, this is an open meeting of the Nantucket Affordable Housing Trust and it's being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement for the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all member of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. <clears throat> the order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment to those members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. For this meeting, the Nantucket Affordable Housing Trust is convening by video conference via the Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note the meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast will be captured and recorded. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless I note otherwise. We are turning to the first item on the agenda for this public information or this public meeting. Um, and before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of business to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda after they conclude their remarks. The chair will go down the line of members and registered participants, inviting each of them to provide any comment or questions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking and remember to speak clearly. For any response, please wait for the chair to yield your, the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in conversation with other members, please do so through the chair taking care to identify yourself. After, um, after panelists and members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to the members of the public who have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and be acknowledged uh, by and speak through the chair. Uh, turning to, let's see, Anna Day, Susan Campy. Oh, Rima, um, Rima, can you hear us? Rima Sherry? Connection is crap today. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to work through a tough connection, um, internet connection for Rima, and we'll do what we can. Um, we otherwise... Eleanor, how should I manage a, a vote in the situation? It looks like her screen is now frozen completely. Oh boy. Well, there she is. She's not frozen. I guess, you mean if she's frozen when you're trying to take a vote? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Brian? Yes, David. So through you, it, she might want to change, turn off her video and then that will help things the audio yeah the bandwidth issue you're right yeah and i'm probably gonna have to do the same because half the people are frozen on my screen too okay 
Okay. Penny? Penny, Penny. Yeah, or, or just come in by phone instead of through the link. So I, I'm not even sure if Rima can hear any of this. Um, if somebody uh, has her number and can text her, that might be worthwhile. All right, if I need to do that, I need to give me a second, okay? Um, okay, it looks like, so she's trying to do the screen. Rima, how's your audio? She dropped off. Oh, no, there she is. Rima, can you hear? Hold on. Uh, I, I'm just going to text her now. Um, the phone number, Brian? I, I've got it. Okay. Oh, were you going to give me the Zoom telephone or her telephone? Yeah. No, I have her. No, the Zoom thing to call is in the, if you open on your computer, the meeting, let me send it to her. Hopefully she can. I could just tell it to you if you want. I've, I've got it, it's the, the meeting okay. ID. You dial the meeting. It's, it, it's just 646-558-8656. But then you gotta do all that other stuff, don't you? No, no it's automatic. Oh, okay. One more time, 646. Five five eight eight six five six. Okay, great. Thank you, Penny. Okay, so I will turn to the first item on the agenda because we do have a quorum and hopefully she can get in with us. Um, look for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Uh, and second. a second. Moved by Penny, second by Dave. Uh, by roll call, Allison Mitchell. Aye. Penny Dye. Aye. Brooke Moore. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. Christy Farantella. Aye. And Brian Sullivan, goodbye. Um, you want to see if Rima, Rima, can you hear? She's there, but she's, oh, let me try on the phone. Here she comes. Wait, let's hang, hang in, see if she, I just admitted her by phone. Rima? <sighs> Trying to join by phone. Okay, rather than have technology slow us down too much, um, I guess we'll have Rima abstain from that vote. Well, she's oh. just not present, so it's not even abstention. Okay, great. Um, moving to the next item, we have a. Um, Yes, Penny. Yeah, Sully, did you vote? I did. I voted. Okay, sorry. I, Thanks. Yep, I voted I. It was unanimous. Um, Rima's here now on the phone, so we do have her. Rima, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, can great. Can you hear me? We, we, can, we can hear you. You need to shut your something off. Oh, yeah, there turn off your computer, Remus. There's not a. Oh. Oh, wait a minute. Now I'm confused. Okay. Uh, I did. So, Rima, while you work through that, we've approved the agenda. Um, I'm now going to open closing cost assistance. Um, item number three we have a uh, mortgage application from Emily Millington. And I believe that this is sort of just a reassignment. Um, Eleanor, can you? It's uh, a result of a divorce. So they are discharged. Yeah, no, discharging... I got rid of the computer. So... Okay, so they're completely discharging the existing mortgage to the trust to be basically replaced with a uh, almost identical mortgage, except it will be simply to um, Emily Millington as opposed to she and her future ex-spouse. So I, I have already crafted a motion if you'd like me to read it and someone can move it if you'd like. Please. Uh, the motion was made to approve the discharge of the mortgage from Ricky Lee Millington and Emily Millington to the Nantucket Affordable Housing Trust Fund recorded at book 1705, page 195, to concurrently approve a new mortgage in the same amount of original mortgage from Emily Millington to the trust and to authorize the chair to sign documents related to the, to the 
new mortgage on behalf of the Nantucket related to this matter on behalf of the Nantucket Affordable Housing Trust. Great. Thank you. Is there any discussion on that motion? I'll make the motion. I will make it. And okay. I'll second. So, so who, who made it? Christy? Christy's Chris. made it. Brooke is seconding it. Um, a vote by roll call. As I see you, Petty Dye. Aye. Brooke Moore. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. Christy Ferrantella. Aye. Rima Sherry. Aye. Allison Mitchell. Aye. <laughs> And Brian Sullivan's and I. Rima. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so to item number four, uh, we are going to move into the warrant article discussion. Um, I think probably best if we take these in the order that they appear in the packet. Um, I'm just trying to get to the right first. Page. So it looks like it's page 28 is the opening um, of uh, this, this agenda item. Um, we, have a we have a chart that we've seen in the past. Um, some of us, there's been a little bit of updating. Um, I just mentioned that and pointed out some members of the general public might want to observe that. Penny? Yeah, are we going to take these in the order in which they're published in the warrant? Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I see no reason. Okay, not I to. think the first the first one is thirty eight. It's on page eight. Page eight of the packet, or no, page... it's, no, not of the, the actual warrant. If anybody is using the warrant, well, I used, I actually put it in the packet, so you don't have to go through the entire warrant. So if you go to page thirty-seven of the packet, you have Article twenty-three. I don't know if I don't think I received the packet. It was posted yesterday. I mean, I forgot to send. Can it you over. send it to me again, please? Sure, sure, sure. Thanks. I'll just send you the packet as an attachment. I'll send it to all of you. I apologize. Yesterday was a little crazy catch up. <sighs> okay, so while we while we work through that item, um, does anybody want to spend any time questioning or discussing kind of the uh, the shy chart, that the estimated shy list count chart, or kind of go over that? Is everybody relatively clear? Okay, seeing. Brooke? So I think it's just, it, it's just important to note for the public that, that there are plans in place with, um, that we utilize the Neighborhood First and CPC funding from two years ago to set up a timeline for um, staying in Safe Harbor and developing subsidized housing inventory listed units to remain in Safe Harbor. And, it, and the way I describe it is it's a parallel path to the build out at Richmond development because Richmond will contribute approximately half of our um, final 490 units as they complete their build out in, in, through to 2025. And so what we've organized is a parallel path to remain in safe harbor as those units of which some will be subsidized housing inventory. They will all go on the subsidized housing inventory, but they won't contribute to annual safe harbor over the next four years. And so we have to stay also on a parallel path of remaining in safe harbor with year by year unit development at, an, at 24 units a year um, until they're built out. So it's a process that will take five years to reach 10%. Um, uh, because of the commitment of that many units out of the Richmond Great Point development toward our final 10%. So hopefully that's helpful for the public. Great. Thank you, Brooke. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we move our way to article 23, Penny, do you have the packet yet? Are you? Yeah, I'm all good? set. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, so Article 23, it's an appropriation to the Affordable Housing Trust. It reads to see if the town will vote to raise an appropriate borrow or transfer from available funds the sum of $475,000 to deposit into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund uh, established pursuant to Mass General Law C44 Section 
55C for fiscal year 2022. Um, so this is kind of a uh, general funding coming from the select board. Christy, do you have anything that you'd like to add or comment to this article? No, not at the moment. Okay. I'll open it up to general comments or questions or... Go ahead, Brooke. So just as a point of clarification, the intention of this article is to fund the ongoing operations of the Affordable Housing Trust, including um, staff salaries, um, as our work has grown, the staff needs have grown. And so um, we, we um, a request was made to town administration and the select board for funding um, to add some administrative support uh, for the increased workload, as well as uh, supporting in part um, our closing cost assistance program and our uh, covenant loan formation programs. I mean, covenant, wait, covenant formation assistance program, CFAP. Um, and so those are sort of the ongoing programs that we have that um, we requested regular funding. And I think the intention is from the select board and town administration to fund at a minimum this level on an ongoing basis for our operations. Any other thoughts, comments, or questions to share about it? Go ahead, Christy. Thank you. I think it's going to be important as we approach town meeting um, with all these different housing articles to you know, clearly say that this is more for admin and for the other um, policies and opportunities that the Affordable Housing Trust Fund put forward, like the closing cost assistance. Uh, from uh, the creation of shy units. So just making sure we kind of distinguish between this and other articles. Great, thank you, Christy. Dave? Yeah, I mean, along with what Christy's saying, I just think it's important that, um, that we make at least some kind of informational sheet that we can hand out about how this different funds that we ask for are limited by what they can be used for. Because I think that most people just think we get a pile of money, we can use it for whatever. And they don't understand that CPC funds are, are you know, can only be used for certain projects with, with certain, um, you know, cert, certain income and, and that they just see the full picture instead of just thinking we're grubbing money and it all can be used for the same thing. Right, so purely administrative cost, consultant cost. On this um, one, yes, but on, on, the, this one. on the ones we have coming forward, I think, again, it's important that we let people know that we're restricted in how this, these funds are used. Great. And, you know, I, I, I don't have a definitive uh, plan for the board here, whether we want to kind of take a, meet, uh, um, a feeling of the meeting on everyone's opinion on these or take an actual vote on how we choose as a board to support or not each of these articles. Um, I guess I kind of look to a feeling of the group um, as we move through them. Um, it doesn't seem that this one in particular has much more for discussion. You can make a motion, if you like, to recommend support or not. Okay. So I would, I would look to a member of the, the board how they feel about making a motion on this article in particular. So I, Go ahead, bro. so, so I guess, I mean, this one's pretty simple. I, I would be pleased to make a motion that the trust support this article 23. Um, it's, it's something we've requested and the, and town administration has put on the warrant on our behalf. And so um, this one's as clear as a bell to me that we should. So I will make that motion that we um, support this article. Okay. No second. Any, so uh, moved by Brooke, second by Rima. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, we'll take a vote by roll call. Penny Dye. Aye. Brooke Moore. Aye. Dave Iverson. Dave, are you frozen? Uh, I'm here. Aye. You say my name? I did. Sorry. I, I might have been frozen for a sec. Uh, uh, Rima, Sherry. Aye. Christy Ferentella? Aye. Allison Mitchell? Aye. And Brian Sullivan is an aye. Okay, so we got to our first one. Let's move to Article 24. Brian? Yes. Brian? Yes, Dave. Um, and with that said, 
can you hear me? Can am I yes. coming through? Uh, I, and I and maybe Eleanor can answer this. Can we also put a note on this as it goes to FinCom saying these monies are used for? I mean, they might know, they might not know. I just think it's important that the information is there and easy to find in their face. Yes, Brooke. You guys, I am posting in the event that a quorum is attained, and even if not, you can go to the both FinCom meetings Thursday and then again on Monday. And you can explicate that and, and flesh out the details if you like. But my plan was to, after checking with Tucker and Brian, to send these draft minutes to Denise Cronow. So she sees what recommendations this board is making in terms of their subsequent review and endorsement or not of the articles. So you, you can certainly make the motion more detailed, but I think also you could say something during the meeting if you wanted to be have it on the record there as well. Uh, Great. Thank you, Eleanor. Brooke, did you have? Yeah, I, I expect that um, I plan to be present at FinCom on Monday to explain in detail to the finance committee. Um, and Tucker has laid out some spreadsheets as well on, on what goes in, what, what's intended for what in terms of um, the articles the select board put forward um, this year, the, the rationale behind those requests. Right, Christy? Christy, go ahead. Thank you. I thought part of this meeting is to or kind of how we're going to present to FinCom. So I think it would be helpful if we had a little cheat sheet to give them before Monday of, you know, this article would be used for this funding, you know, maybe a column of this is what it can be used for, this column of what it can't be used for, and then maybe what the motion was for from the Affordable Housing Trust on which ones, you know, we want to see pushed through and important to distinguish between kind of the admin cost, short-term cost, long-term cost, things like that. Brooke, do you want to do that? Because I didn't, I will not be able to do that. And Tucker, of course, is off the grid right now. Yes. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, guys. Um, so moving to the next article um, that we have on the list, article number 24, uh, it's an appropriation for the Affordable Housing Trust to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate borrow transfer from funds available, the sum of $7,500,000 to pay the cost of acquiring existing properties for affordable housing purposes, which may include affordable rental program and also for the acquisition interest in or deed restrictions on properties for affordable housing purposes, including the payment of all costs incidental and hereto, or excuse me, related thereto, provided that all such interests or deed restrictions add affordable housing units to the town's subsidized housing inventory within the meaning of GLC 40B to be spent by the town manager with the approval of the select board, which may include a grant or grants to the Nantucket Affordable Housing Trust with oversight by the select board that to meet said appropriation, the treasurer with the approval of the select board is hereby authorized to borrow the sum of 7,500,000 pursuant to GLC 44.7, or I don't know, squiggly line seven or eight, or any other enabling authority to issue bonds and notes to the town therefore provided, however, that any borrowing authorized here under shall be contingent on the passage of a proposition two and a half debt exclusion vote or to take any other action relative thereto. So having read that, um, again, Christy, I'll come back to you as the select board member to make any comments. And then if you would translate that to the general public as far as the steps in the process of how a town meeting vote would go to a ballot. Absolutely. So this is a seven and a half million dollar debt exclusion to help maintain Safe Harbor. Um, so the way I'm explaining it and happy to have everyone else chip in um, is that the original $20 million for the neighborhood first kind of helped build the structure for staying in Safe Harbor and that this seven and a half million will help maintain that um, Safe Harbor into 2025. And so the way it will work is it will go to town meeting and it would have approval from town meeting. And then also on the ballot, we'll need approval. So 
if it passes at town meeting and fails at the ballot, it doesn't move forward. Same if it fails at town meeting, but passes on the ballot, it doesn't move forward. So it needs both town meeting and ballot. And both of those are majority. Um, so just 51%. Uh, may thank, I thank, thank you, Christy. Um, Penny, hang on one second. Go ahead, Eleanor. I'm sorry. I remember, I do recall that there are some caveats about our making recommendations when there's a ballot measure. So I need to find that before we do anything specific here. I think Penny was probably going to say the same thing. <laughs> okay. Penny? Let me find that and I'll get back to that. Great. Great. We won't take any motions until you come back to us. Go ahead. Penny. That was that was one thing. And the second thing is typically when there's a debt exclusion override, whoever the proponents of something of an, of an article like this are will have calculated what that adds to the average tax bill on the mill rate. Christy, has that been done through Brian? Um, through you, Brian. That has not been done yet. Um, I'm sure Brian Turbot will be coming out with those figures shortly. That might be helpful to know. Yes. Thank you. Brooke, go ahead. So um, the way I would describe this article is um, town administration's response to um, the outline that our, that Tucker and Ken presented to um, the finance department, um, town administration and the select board on the plans this trust has in terms of utilizing um, the, the funds we got in 2019 um, we've made some property acquisitions and we've set up a, um, a timeline of sorts into which we've, we have plans to slot tranches of um, unit creation that are intended to be certified to, um, as safe harbor uh, to give us um, periods of safe harbor, again, as I had said earlier, in the years to come as we build out, um, create units toward our full 10% requirement. And that, um, that when, when town administration and the select board were presented with um, sort of the, what do you need money for and why, this represents sort of the first ask for the next potential tranche of safe harbor after the Tacoma Green development, if assuming it gets its LIHTC financing, uh, would give us two years of safe harbor, we need to start the process of lining up the development. And, and while this money isn't tied to a particular project, our, our concept is that the acquisition of the property at Orange Street would be lined up as our next contributing project for um, Safe Harbor, um, for that next year of Safe Harbor after Tacoma Green. And I think it's really important for the public to understand that we don't go to the Safe Harbor store and buy a year on a week's notice. It sometimes takes several years to get a, a, a project lined up, RF, a request for proposals, a developer identified, subsidizing, uh, lined up um, and planning approval because depending on which route we take to ask for certification, um, it may require planning board approval, it may require a financing scheme. And so this takes time. So we can't wait for two years and, and go to the safe harbor store and buy our next year. We have to start now. And this article was the decision of um, town administration to allocate the funding for that next tranche of safe harbor units that will be that will be developed a couple of years from now but we need to know the money's available now in order to to engage in that development process and have this queued up in time to keep that safe harbor timeline um, without any gaps without any potential for uh, 40B developments to be applied for at the state level. So that's kind of the way I would describe it. It's sort of the next short term funding that's, the, that's critical in that uh, process of maintaining Safe Harbor. Thank you, Brooke. Brian, I have the quote if you want to hear it before. Just, just, just one second, let me call Penny. Okay. 
Um, just if maybe through you to Brooke, if Brooke could clarify that the proposed net additional units on the chart for 2021 are 166, which would actually get us two years, right? No, those are those are shy listed units, but not necessarily units that are eligible for certification for safe harbor. So we have to be really careful to understand that that a development like Richmond, for instance, has 225 units. However, they're only eligible for safe harbor certification under certain circumstances year by year. So as they build out, they will add units to the shy list, but they don't add units to safe harbor, so, which is an interim status on our way to 10%. So, so I understand that, but I think it's confusing on this chart because it talks about subtotal net additional units, 166. And for two years, sort of, I mean, it's, it just needs to be clarified what's what. Yeah. I mean, if I'm confused, the general public is going to be confused uh, more about this. I, 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 it's, I would I hazard that. Guess. Thank you. I completely <clears throat> agree. It's, it's complicated. <laughs> Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Brooke. Eleanor, do you want to cover that language? Sure, I'll read the whole thing. Uh, it's from an email that was sent by town council. No, to Tucker. No, no. Um, and this, this actually is in the minutes from the February 2nd meeting. There is no legal prohibition against the trust from stating a recommendation on any article that comes before town meeting as long as the recommendation was voted at a duly posted meeting of the trust. There is certainly inherent authority in the trust enabling legislation to make such recommendation. If the trust wished to include a short recommendation in the finance committee booklet, that should be coordinated with the town manager and the finance committee. Further, if there is a ballot question associated with the warrant article, the trust should take care not to produce or mail any written material using town resources advocating presumably the passage of the ballot question. It may, however, make a recommendation with respect to town meeting action, but the ballot question should not be referenced. Okay, so that last sentence confuses me just enough that potentially not to take a voted position today on this article, but we should work our way through a conversation about it. Um, I, I, are there other members that want to comment at following Brooke and Penny's questions? You know, personally, when I look at this and we talk about it somewhat technically, um, and, and I think about it in the sense of the general public, I, I'm hopeful that um, with ease at town meeting, it would be an article to pass because it is a direct funding opportunity that um, could allow us to keep moving on the work that we're doing. Um, I have some general concerns that it is a one-time lump of money and not a reoccurring funding source. And then always getting to the ballot um, and through the ballot with 51% um, is a lot of work. I have listened to uh, some select board meetings where uh, there are members of the select board who have pointed out there are a number of either debt override exclusions um, that this will be, we'll say, quote, in competition with. Uh, so while uh, fully and wholeheartedly supporting this, I do worry about the result making it through a ballot along with the other things that are there. So while it's logical and makes the greatest amount of sense to me personally, um, I don't know that it will be there at the end of the day. Um, and I am appreciative that town administration brought it to the table. Those are my personal comments. Brooke, I think you raised your hand before I spoke and if there's anybody else. I was just gonna say my understanding is that we can support the warrant article, but not take any kind of action on the ballot measure. Okay. But that's up to my fellow board members. Um, I'd like to continue discussion on it. It feels like I, the, the feeling I'm getting is that maybe it, it, we don't take a vote, but I think it would be nice for the conversation to be in the record um, that people understand the board's position. Does anybody else want to make a comment or 
have a thought before I open the conversation to the general public? Okay, I'm seeing no action. So I will, oh, Rima. Okay, sorry, I'm not used to the phone mute, unmute. Um, yeah, I would just uh, say that uh, this would be a very helpful um, article, funding article for us and uh, that um, all funding is helpful, but a big chunk that is uh, directed at the um, continuation of our shy, maintaining our uh, safe harbor and our shy inventory is really important. I, uh, thank you, Rima. Um, I do want to mention that on Dave's comment that he made earlier about a chart, the way, if, if I understand this article, how it is written correctly, that these funds will need to be used to produce only shy qualified units, which a minimum of 25% of them will have to be 80% AMI um, if they're rental units and it becomes an expensive subsidy. Um, so as we're using these dollars, it will also have a second check of um, the Board of Selectmen's approval on whatever action this board would take. So I just wanna make sure that's in the record for the public. Uh, first, Christy, then Brooke. I was gonna add, and this goes up to 200% AMI. And I believe this is only for rentals, not homeownership, but I think Brooke's gonna comment on this as well. Great. I believe it's a relatively unrestricted funding source. I, I believe our intention when we described it to town administration and the select board was that it, that it is intended for safe harbor use. But as I read the warrant article, it says, which may include an affordable rental program. It, it is, I believe it is much less restricted than the neighborhood first in terms of the subsidized housing inventory, um, which was prescribed in the Warren article. Um, I read this as being much more um, flexible in, in its potential use. However, it is our intention in, when this was requested, it was, it was identified as being um, targeted toward this continued work toward 10% uh, and, and to remain in safe harbor. Reva? Um, the wording says that uh, all cost incidental uh, provided that all of such interests or deed restrictions add affordable housing units to the town subsidized housing inventory. So I think it okay. does have it doesn't to be, yeah, it's, right. it's, it's in the middle. Yep. So if yep. This, okay. is for, this is for shy uh, qualified units, um, either ownership or um, rental. You're right. Sorry, I misread it. Any other board comments before we offer any members of the public? Okay, seeing no board, um, I'll, I don't know how to check for hands being raised, but I'll open it. I don't see any raised hands. Okay. All right, so I think that, is, is there a, a general, um, any, any final statements on support or not on this article? I think we're gonna move, kind of move into the next one without a vote uh, based, based on the override statement in the last sentence of what was sent. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I will scroll to Article 22. Um, that's an appropriation. Fiscal year 2022 Community Preservation Committee, often referred to as the CPC. Uh, 32. Oh, sorry, Article 32. It's year, fiscal year 2022. Um, to see if the town will vote act, to vote to act on the report of the Community Preservation Committee on the fiscal year 2022 community preservation budget and to appropriate or reserve or for later appropriation monies from the community preservation fund annual revenues or available funds for the administration, administrative and operating expenses of community preservation committee and the undertaking 
of the community preservation projects and all the other necessary and proper expenses for the year. Um, the line item reads for the creation and preservation support rehabilitation and restoration of affordable housing for year round Nantucket residents in support of plans developed by Habitat for Humanity and Housing Nantucket to create up to six new affordable units, $800,000. Um, and then we have highlighted a second in the packet, the Town of Nantucket line item, funds to pay the interest and principal of the $5 million bond authorized at the 2019 Nantucket Town Meeting to pay the cost of acquiring land, which may include buildings thereon for the development of affordable housing, and to pay the cost designing construction, reconstruction, and equipping affordable housing, 350,000. Um, so to break those down, the latter is to support um, the previous bond interest, um, which we've been working through, and the 800,000 would be for new creation um, as a for the general public, as a CPC sponsored article, these have to be spent on units that would be 100% AMI or less. Um, in their creation or maintenance or support or rehabilitation. So with that, I'll open to the board for any comments. Uh, Brooke? Generally speaking, um, we uh, require Habitat and Housing Nantucket to create units that are shy list eligible when they receive these grants. So I so they. I think it is important to just kind of acknowledge and, and recognize that the, the kind of the flow through of money and that the process that has happened in the last few years uh, with the trust working with the CPC um, for the release of funds, the CPC has been, we'll say for lack of a better term, kind of banking the money at the trust. Um, so then these individual uh, housing advocacy groups can come midstream of the fiscal year and make application for grants to maintain, build, rehab existing projects. Um, in the past, before the trust was organized as it is now, um, those individual housing advocacy groups would make their own applications. Um, so this has been a process that has worked for the last few years um, so that the money can be distributed uh, throughout the, the fiscal year. So that's just kind of a general public note. Um, any other commentary from board members? Rima? Yeah, for the record, this allows us to continue um, our grants to Housing Nantucket and Habitat and um, to pay off the uh, debt service uh, allows the CPC to pay off the debt service on the five million that was uh, set up for us at last town meeting. So it's an important article, and um, I think uh, it would be worth it to say that we support it, but that funds are again restricted to uh, one hundred percent AMI or less. And and to those two housing advocacy groups, the way that it's written, so it's for distribution to those well established and well run groups. Are there any more board comments? I've seen one member of the public turn their screen on. I think they want to comment. Anyone before I turn? No. And did you want to make a comment, or am I putting you on the spot? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just say um, that everything that you said there was true and that um, it works for us to apply for these funds from you so we can all plan out and coordinate what the needs are going to be in the year, years ahead. Thank you. I don't see anyone from Habitat today, but I know they have a number of ongoing projects and have been working to get their units um, shy included. So I applaud their efforts while not here at the moment. Um, is there a motion that we would like to hear on this? 
Everybody jump at once. Come in. Penny. Yeah, I'll make a motion that we support this article. Um, we're the ones who asked for this this funding, so we should really be supporting this article. Great. I'll and second. A, and a second from Rima. Um, and by roll call, Penny Dye. Aye. Brooke Moore. Aye. Christy Ferrantella. Aye. Rima Sherry. Aye. Allison Mitchell. Aye. And Dave Iverson. Aye. And lastly, Brian Sullivan. Aye. Great. Thank you, guys. All right. Article 38. Um, Affordable and year-round housing stabilization fund. See if the town will vote to dedicate without further appropriation into a special purpose affordable and year-round housing stabilization fund created here on in accordance with MGL chapter 40 section 5b which was accepted by the town at 2017 annual town meeting for the purpose of meeting affordable and year-round housing needs two-thirds of the local options rooms excise tax that the town receives on the transfer of the occupancy of the room in a bed and breakfast establishment, hotel, lodging house, short-term rental or motel, pursuant to the acceptance of the MGL chapter 64G section 3A as amended chapter 337, the acts of 2018 provided by, or provided that said dedication shall affect beginning in the fiscal year 2022. Um, this is a private citizen article presented by Arthur Reed. Arthur did come to the group and make his presentation, um, offered an opportunity for some question and answer. In that time period, um, I think on the high level, it's important that everyone understands that the money that goes into a stabilization fund then on an annual basis needs to be voted out of the stabilization fund at the subsequent town meeting. So this does, this article, um, while it would generate reoccurring revenue, would always have the public body of town meeting as kind of the check group to make sure that they were satisfied with the work of the body of the trust at the time period um, that was executing the funding. So um, with that, I'll open the floor and Penny. Yeah, through you to Christy, um, when, when the proposal the sponsor came and spoke with us. We didn't have an exact or an exact range even of what the two thirds or of what the 6% local would constitute. Somebody was throwing around the number of 7 million uh, for 2020, in which case two thirds would be 4.6 million. I am a very strong supporter of this article, um, primarily for the reason that it is a sustainable source of income directly tied to the rental business here on Nantucket. Thank you. Great, thank you, Penny. Christy, did you wanna address that ballpark figure or? Yeah, that's the figures that we've been hearing as well from Brian Turbot. You're on okay. Okay. Great, Brooke. So I actually asked Brian Turbot a few questions about this article just for my own edification. And um, would you identify who Brian is for the public? Brian Turbot is the finance director for the town of Nantucket. Thank so you. Um, he's the person who determines where the money, how much money and um, so forth. And so I, I, I would like to um, offer the following information that um, I asked when this would be effective and it would be effective beginning July 1st, two thirds of the local options tax. M my understanding is the local options tax includes what was in existence as a rooms tax prior to the addition of the short-term rental addition, additional tax. So this, this article affects all the local options, room lodging tax, not just the part generated from short-term rentals. So it, it, I see Penny's hand up. So, Go ahead, Brooke, keep you finished and then we'll come. Okay, all right. So, um, so I asked, what is the total revenue thus far in fiscal 2021, which began in July, uh, uh, June, July 1st of 2020, and through the end of the year, 
uh, the local options tax in its entirety had generated $7,124,000, which those two quarters of the year are the lion's share anyway, because the other two quarters are winter and spring, which are lower, it, it historically have generated substantially lower revenue. Um, and I asked, what is the amount of this tax that has been committed to the general fund revenue side for fiscal year 2022? And uh, the response is $5 million, which represents 70% of the amount received to, to date. So just to be clear, the annual proposed budget for fiscal 2022 has in it utilized 70% of the full local options tax to balance the annual town budget. Um, and then I asked, how do you determine how much of the tax is available to be included in the general fund or to be allocated to this fund? Uh, we, re we use a review of the last five years, review of the first payment in the current fiscal year to come to a starting point, which is reviewed as we progress through the budget cycle. So, um, and then I said, if this article passes, how much of a deficit will it leave in the 2022 budget? Um, because clearly if you, if they've taken 70% and this article proposes to take 66%, we got a problem. It's greater than hundred percent, right? So, uh, and the answer was, the question has multiple parts to it. In terms of the actual budget, there will be an immediate deficit of approximately 3.35 million, which would have to be made up somehow and could include substantial reductions. And those reductions could impact all planned budgetary funding. The other issue is that a severe loss of revenue would impact free cash and the town's ability to finance various capital projects because of a reduction in free cash it would impact the reserves that the town maintains. So I just wanted to be clear what the impact of this article is on the on town finances as I was debating it in my head and I just thought that would be helpful information. Very helpful, thank you, Brooke. Penny? Yeah, I just wanna follow up to that and say, and this is all part of what we go through every, every year at this time of the year in balancing the budget. We don't know what the finance committee is going to approve on any of the articles with any level of certainty, any degree of certainty. And um, I also wanna point out that with the reduction in um, traditional guest houses and inns that it's, that's occurred here over the last 20 years, it would stand to reason that the bulk of this short, this room occupancy tax would be coming from the rentals of people's private homes. And it'll be very interesting in two or three years from now to look at the ratios on that because in my opinion, it will be heavily geared towards vacation rentals of private homes. Thanks. Great, thank you, Penny. Henry, give us a few more minutes. I will come back to you so you don't have to hold your hand up. Um, any other board members with comment? So I'll take a moment um, and say that when it was my understanding when the uh, short-term rental tax kind of expanded open to include vacation rentals that when it was kind of passed down from the state uh, that the intent was a use for affordable housing uh, and water quality. And I stood uh, in front of the Board of Selectmen as an individual and uh, fought against other members in my field in the real estate industry for the tax, for the Board of Selectmen to set the tax at 6% um, at the maximum that they had the opportunity to, because I didn't believe that it would negatively affect the rental place and it would generate revenue that would come to um, affordable housing. Uh, at that time, I believe the Board of Selectmen was kind of kicking back and forth between 2% and 3%, then it pushed to six. Um, now that we're in a place that, um, you know, the money has the opportunity to work towards affordable housing. I would like to see the, you know, my own personal efforts of that conversation um, so long ago, trying to get the number higher where it is to then be guaranteed to be pointed in the direction. I don't like the problem that it creates for administration in any sort of deficit, but 
um, as Penny's point is, you know, we it's it's the job of the finance department to work through the budgets and see where they can make up these shortfalls and issues and opportunities. That's my, my personal opinion. So um, along with my fellow board member Penny, I personally support this one. Christy. Thank you. Um, so I agree. Uh, when the board adopted that, that was before I was on the select board and the conversation was around you know, using the funds for affordable housing and better quality, um, neither of which have been used so far. So one thing that I've been saying about this article is that tourism impacts so many aspects of our economy and our town budget, um, you know, from DPW to landfill to, you know, our roads and traffic and everything. So seeing two thirds of it go to housing is a little bit of a concern for that we have funds for water quality and all the other things that tourism impacts our, our um, environment on. So that's the one thing that I have with this article is having the full two thirds. Um, so you know, I, I can support it, but I would like to see a, a little bit of a reduction in how much is going straight to housing and how much could go to other aspects. Thanks. Just Thanks, Christy. Penny, back to you. Yeah, sorry for talking so much, but Christy, just as a quick follow up, the um, the the room occupancy tax allows for you, for the select board, to raise another percentage. I think it was up to two point seven percent for water quality. If you, the select board, decide that that's warranted in our community, thank you. Thanks, Penny. Are there any other board members with comment? Brooke? So I, I just want to make sure that everybody in the public is clear what the, so all of these funding streams, they're, they're not equal. Like these dollars are not all the same. They have different restrictions, different limitations on them. So for instance, we talked about the CPC, funding only being eligible to be used on units that are deed restricted at 100% AMI or below. Um, this uh, funding stream is, is relatively flexible in how we can utilize it as a board, but it has this extra hurdle of coming into a stabilization fund and then having to be voted out of the stabilization fund with a two thirds vote at town meeting. So there is a year, there's at least a year delay before we would have access to the funds. So we would complete fiscal 2022 and then at town meeting next April, there would be an authorization on the warrant to withdraw those funds from the stabilization fund. And that requires a two thirds vote at town meeting. So while the funds are flexible in how we can spend them, getting access to them has a level of challenge that some of the other um, funding streams don't, like a debt exclusion um, or a transfer fee or some of the other things that, we'll be, that we're talking about through all of this. So I think it's helpful to understand how these fit into what I call a funding puzzle or a, or a smorgasbord. And so I just wanna be clear on those limitations as well. Um, but I too support this article, maybe at a bit of a lower percentage than two thirds. Um, Penny and then Allison. Thank you. Um, I, that should that to your comment to Brooks comment and also Brian's earlier about the delay on um, disbursement of these funds. I think that works fine. And we keep saying how we have to plan ahead so many years. I also want to just last thing I'm going to say about this is if you if we add together the total funding on the four articles we've already discussed, we're at 14 million. 875,000, and I just want to throw that out there. And now I'm going to not talk anymore. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Penny. Um, Megan, I see you, but I'm going to keep working through the board. Allison, Mitchell. I'm keeping my video off just because my connection is terrible. Thank you, Sally. Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate uh, what Brooke said. Uh, you know, I'm obviously personally and as a trust member in, in um, support of all funding because we need funding. Um, but I just want to make sure the public understands that, you know, it, all of these options essentially this year, um, there really isn't one right answer, I think, that's going to kind of get us to the end of the rainbow. Um, and this this article's excellent. It's going to get us funding. It's going to be more flexible than some of the other ones. Um, but I think it's important to 
to look at everything that's there um, and look at the pros and the cons and, and really see how they go together in a puzzle, like Brooke said, um, because, uh, you know, the reality is about something like this and, and is that, you know, every year we won't even, even if we know that we have to go to town meeting to get the money, we won't know exactly how much money we're looking at. Um, you know, what if one year we're really hoping that we're going to get 5 million and it ends up, we get, we, we end up getting three um, and it just kind of puts our plans, you know, another year or two behind. So just, I would encourage anyone from the public that's paying attention to all these articles to understand that there's a good chance that the best answer is a lot of them combined. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Allison. Any other board members? Okay, seeing none, I'll come back to Henry Sanford. Sorry, guys. Um, thanks. So I, Penny kind of said what, you know, I was just going to say is that um, coming from, uh, I work in, just for everyone else's uh, knowledge, I work in real estate sales and rentals, but I also manage the Hawthorne House Hotel. So I kind of have a seat from two places uh, when it comes to short-term rental tax um, as a business who, you know, has to pay the DRR in two different ways. So, you know, I just think it's important to acknowledge that short-term rentals are like a, a, they are a global travel trend. It's not going away. You know, there's, it, you can pick your number of studies, but, um, you know, people are, travelers are preferring to stay in homes. I think we all know this. So I see article 38 is kind of a, appropriate mechanism, even if it is not, um, and thank you for educating, not as stable as it appears in the warrant um, for all the reasons you guys just explained, but it is at least there to take kind of the fair share from short-term rentals to help affordable housing. And I think that that's important because it's this growing industry, this growing trend, and then Article 38 kind of takes advantage of that and works works with that trend to uh, to capture the value. So I support it as an individual, but I just thought that I would put that in there. Thank you, Henry. Um, I, I, I see just Megan, I'm assuming it's Megan Perry. If you could announce yourself. Hi, Brian. Yes, it is Megan Perry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I really appreciate all the comments that Penny just gave. And I, as a citizen, a taxpayer and a voter, I appreciate the checks and balance that this article provides so that the community can have a bit of a say in how we shape things, um, in particular, how money is spent on affordable housing. So um, I think this is a great article. That was it. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Mr. Dickler. Uh, I'd like to join that course and especially uh, echo what uh, Mr. Stanford said. Uh, I think there's no doubt that the uh, thirst for Nantucket housing by non-residents has contributed to the lack of affordable housing by taking year-round housing off the market. So it's entirely appropriate to use some of this tax to support affordable housing. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Dickler. Are there any more comments from the board? If not, I'd look for a motion on this article. I'll make a motion since I got unmuted first to support this article. Great, is there a second? I got a second from Dave by roll call, Penny Dye. Aye. Uh, Brooke Moore. Aye. Christy Ferentala. Aye. Rima Sherry. Aye. Allison Mitchell. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. And Brian Sullivan. Aye. Great. And moving on. Um, article 38. Article 90. Is this the last one? No. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I make a suggestion that we take all the funding articles first since I, my understanding is you and Penny have to have to recuse on Article 90 so that we can um, just work through the funding. Or I have to recuse, I have to present and recuse on this one, 97. And then I can come back and chair when you guys recuse on 90. Okay, great. So, does uh, that sound right, Eleanor? 
Yes, I would agree with that. Um, that, is, that is, in my opinion, too, the best course of action. So let's jump ahead to uh, Article 97, page, starts on page 47. Um, bear with me while I run through this one. Um, Article 97, and, and then on, uh, Article 97. Uh, just, just read the article, not the pre preamble, I think, makes the most sense. Okay. Home rule petition, allocate a portion of land bank real estate transfer fee to support year-round housing. Um, to see if the town will vote to authorize the select board to petition the general court for special legislation to modify the Land Bank Act of 1983, chapter 669 of the Acts of 1983, as amended, to have 25% of the total land bank fee, one quarter of the 2% transaction fee prescribed therein, be transferred directly to the Nantucket Affordable Housing Trust Fund for a period of 20 years to begin on January 1st, 2022, for the purposes of the creation and the preservation of affordable housing in the town of Nantucket for the benefit of year round low and moderate income households consistent with the trust's enabling legislation provided that said special legislation shall include a requirement that the transfer of 25% of the land bank fee to the affordable housing trust fund shall be reduced in any given year by the amount necessary for the land bank to meet its existing debt service obligations and other normal and customary operating expenses of the land bank as certified by the land bank to the select board each year on or before June 30th. And to provide further that the land bank shall not incur any additional debt service obligations or other normal and customary operating expenses that cannot be supported by the remaining 75% of the land bank fees so that certified each year and further to direct the select board that during the pendency of the home rule petition not to enter into a memorandum of understanding that was contemplated in article 30 of the 2020 annual town meeting that would result in incurring of a debt obligation of the land bank that would exceed its available revenue at the adjusted one and a half percent fee or to take any other action related here to. So now I'll turn to Brooke Moore as a private citizen to make her um, statement and then you can recuse from the conversation. So I'll begin by saying when this article was drafted and uh, contemplated being filed, there was no movement toward a sustained funding mechanism for the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, so um, this was my and, and a group of other um, Nantucket residents response to feedback we had gotten at the State House with regard to the Housing Bank Bill Home Rule Petition, which was at the legislative level, we received uh, repeated pushback that they, they, there would not be support for an additional transfer fee and that because we already had a transfer fee, we were encouraged to reallocate a portion of the land bank transfer fee to affordable housing. So that was just the feedback we were getting at the state house. The landscape has changed dramatically in, I mean, dramatically on a lot of levels since this article was originally drafted, filed, uh, contemplated and filed. Um, there are obviously after today's discussion, multiple um, methods for funding the trust on the warrant this year. And so um, my hope for this article was that we would have a conversation about sustained funding mechanism for the affordable housing trust. And lo and behold, here we are today having that conversation, uh, which will continue from here to town meeting as to what the best way to go about um, doing what we, that what I believe, and I think the trust members um, believe is our need for a sustained funding mechanism. Um, that said, the advantages of um, the land bank fee are among them are that it is a relatively unfettered stream of money with a fair amount of flexibility that that is useful for bonding authorization um, to use against borrowing to, for long term and anticipated needs of the trust. So the advantage of that is that we can work more quickly to house Nantucketers, knowing that we have a steady funding stream coming through that's relatively predictable and sustainable to borrow now to accomplish goals 
that we haven't even been able to contemplate as a board, like home ownership opportunities for people above the covenant um, cap within our mandate of up to 200% AMI. And so um, recognizing that in the, in the space of public policy, we have not unlimited financial resources and that as a community, it is not inappropriate to have a conversation about relative priorities of the use of the re financial resources that we have. And so in putting this article forward, I'm simply asking the question that how, how does conservation continued efforts towards setting aside land in conservation stack up against um, what is becoming an increasingly dire situation with year round and affordable housing. And that's really what this article asks the community to contemplate. And I'd like to just cite a couple of um, statistics that I think are um, interesting and illuminating. Um, in 1983, 50, 1987, 53% of Nantucket's landmass was open to development, undeveloped. In 2010, it was 7.8%. And it's currently by, the, by Nathan Porter, the GIS expert of the town at 4.8%. So the, the available property open for the creation of housing for year rounders and affordable housing has shrunk dramatically. And obviously contributing to that is an increase in, in the landmass that's in conservation. And I wanna just say, I have no problem I, I love the land bank. I love what the land bank has done. I think that um, this article is not contemplated as, as something against the land bank. It is contemplated as a question to our community of where our priorities lie from, from a use of, of funding going forward. And I'm thrilled to have this conversation. And currently 51.7% of Nantucket is in conservation through the various organizations. And um, so I will, I'll leave it at that and, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm not sure how we do this in terms of recusal or whether people have questions for me or before, we, before I step away or how that works. Penny? I think we just go through Brian. Um, I have a question. Brooke, you talked um, about uh, how- I, I, uh... No? Um, I, I, I don't know that this is the, the there was a previous, uh, I, don't, uh, I, don't, I don't know, sorry. Well, Brooks, I I, Brooks, Brooks stepped down as a member of this affordable housing trust to present this article, right? Correct. Okay. So shouldn't we have an opportunity to ask some questions? Uh, okay. I, I think okay. at, at at some point at some point she'll have to stop discussing it altogether. I think is is defined by recusal. Um, Maybe evaluate the question. So, so okay, here I'll throw out my my question, my first sure. question, which is um, when when you started when Brooke started to explain the article, um, she talked about how the landscape for other alternative funding sources has changed since she first. Um, came up with the article idea. And one of the things that it might be helpful to share with the public, whether you do it, Brian, or Brooke does, is what's happening at the state house with alternate leg potential legislation to our housing bank home rule petition with other communities. So we've recently um, at the, I think both of the past two meetings uh, there have been updates on the housing bank bill at the state house. Um, I think we're looking at, at a new, I, I wish Tucker were here better to explain this, but um, we're looking at a new window of legislation. It will be reintroduced. It's a two year window of time to work through. Uh, there uh, is a new proponent um, at the state house level that is working on a statewide housing bank bill 
Um, the, Martha's Vineyard has gone so far as to hire their own advocate um, at the state house for a housing bank bill. Um, the timeline on this appears to be another 24 months. Um, I think it's important to note that looking backwards, we're five years into this, if I'm correct. I think we as a body of town meeting have voted to send a housing bank bill to the state house at least three times with unanimous support um, and have yet to get a result at the state level um, where it gets, uh, the bill has stopped in third reading, I think three times um, with the major objector being um, the Massachusetts Association of Realtors. Um, so while there is continued effort and strengthening effort, um, the road has yet to have a destination. Thank you. Okay, so Brooke, so I'm gonna I'm gonna recuse now. I'm just okay. Gonna... Step out. Um, Allison, I see your hand up. I'm not sure if that's a carryover because I can't see your face. Nope. It's okay. new. I know. I'm sorry. Every time no, no. I start my video, I lose everyone. Um, two things. And I just want to piggyback on um, Sully, your, your um, housing bank conversation. I just want to note that the housing bank bill that we put through, um, as well as the ones that are being discussed that potentially would be statewide, um, are only up to 175% AMI, whereas um, as an affordable housing trust, um, unless there are other restrictions like that, we can work with people up to 200% AMI. Um, so I just think that's important. It's a little bit, it's not a lot, but um, I just think it's important to note. Um, but I just like to say, you know, putting my housing advocate hat on um, as a, as a non-homeowner who's wanted to be a homeowner on this island for a really long time. Um, and for the reason that I even joined this trust in the first place, um, I, am, I am in support of this article because I, I see it as the fastest way for us to get a significant amount of funding to start to, to not only maintain safe harbor, to not only maintain our shy list, um, but to start to work on programs that would help a really vast number of people um, in this community. And two of those programs that I'm very much in support of um, are a down payment assistant program and an equity sharing program. I think that being able to get a significant amount of funding sooner rather than later will put a lot more of our community members, our teachers, our firefighters, our police officers, nurses um, into homes that they really need to, to stay here. I, I, it's definitely my personal experience, but I see the tremendous lack of housing available for um, you know, workforce housing available as a real potential devastation to this community over the next five to 10 years. Um, and I see it, I see it personally where I work and where my husband works. So I, I'm in support of this because I see it as an article that's not gonna affect our tax bills. That's going to provide a significant, significant amount of money quickly that can be used flexibly by the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, and, you know, to be honest, and I know this is just my opinion, there's a lot of money that comes in from these home sales that goes into a really, really great cause. But as Brooke already mentioned, there's less than 5% um, of undeveloped land right now on Nantucket to be developed for either new affordable housing or, or to be conserved. Um, and I just think it's something the community really needs to decide what their priority is. And, and so I, I support this article personally. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Um, oh. I, there's a number of public with their hand up, and I do see them. Thank you. I'm going to work way through the board um, for continued comments. Rima, Dave, Christy. Go ahead, Rima. I'm uh, in support of this article. I'm one of the people that signed on to it originally, just, you know, FYI. And um, you know, knowing what the land bank's uh, financial situation is as um, published materials, I don't mm -hmm. think this is going to have a, diff a, a, a difficult effect on them. I think they will be able to function, maybe not quite as freely, but um, 
I think the land bank will continue to be the land bank and be a wonderful and effective uh, part of this community. But I also feel that because this is the fastest path and the least restrictive path to funding for affordable housing, which has been a problem for all the 35 years that I've lived here year round, um, I really feel that we should support the article. And when it comes time for um, a motion, I'd like to make a motion, but I'll wait till we get all the comments in. Great. Thank you, Reva. Um, Chris, I'm gonna go to Dave and then to Christy. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I love this article. I just, I, I, it's just really hard for me personally just to, to um, you, you know, I, I don't think it's a crippling amount of money that they will lose. I just, I think that the, the magic in this article is what's happening now is, is the discussion about it. I think that um, it is super important um, as Allison stated that, you know, there's only 4% left. So whether it's money or whether it's working as a team to identify properties that would be more suitable for, for affordable housing um, and have that in the forefront of, of the um, thought process for the land bank going forward. So I, I, I'm not against this article, but I'm just trying to kind of come to terms with it. Uh, um, I mean, I think it would be great for us as affordable housing trust fund, but I think we've also had all these new sources that we're trying to get come up on in, the, in these Warren articles. So um, I think that if all of those sussed out and, and we got that money, I, I think that, that this article would be less important, but I think it's still important for us to, to work moving forward with the land bank. Great, thank you, Dave. Christy? Thank you. Thank you. I think Dave covered pretty much what I what I was going to say is, um, you know, as Penny's mentioned, we have a lot of options on the table with a lot of different funding sources. So, you know, I think that in presenting to the FinCom, we should have a strong agreement on one versus the other. And, you know, I, I'm in favor of this, but in this, in the Arthur Reed article, um, it, again, I can see pros and cons with both. I might be leaning more towards Arthur Reed. I know we already took a vote on it. I don't know if we'd have to... Um, we look at some of these recommendations, but I think putting everything forward to FinCom um, doesn't stand to show kind of what our plan is with these funds and how what are the pros and cons that we think are is the um, is best for the affordable housing trust. Thank you, Christy. Um, Penny, you were kind of reaching. Did you? Yeah, want to... yeah. Okay. I just I didn't really state my position on this. Um, I I'm not in a position to assess what the land bank does or doesn't need going forward. Um, if we looked at what happened for their operations, um, if we looked at what happened in 2020, they, the land bank, which was an exceptionally unusual year in the transfer of real estate, but the land bank fee generated about 37 million. So this would be about 12 million had that been the case. I. I'm not um, comfortable predicting the market. Markets go up, markets go down. In a normal market, we have about three to 400 properties listed for sale on this island. This morning, there are 140, okay? So it, it could be quite different this year. I am fundamentally opposed to altering the land bank legislation. I commend the proponents for starting this dialogue. I personally have been to Boston, I don't know, six times to testify on the housing, in favor of the housing bank bill. I just don't think this is the way to go. So I won't be supporting it. Thank you. Thanks, Penny. Are there other board members? So seeing no other board members, my, my personal comments are, I do appreciate that this has a sunset of 20 years. Um, within that window, I would expect, you know, the, uh, the acquisition and use of the remaining 4.8% between conservation and um, development, uh, three quarters of that being able to uh, stay with the land bank to continue their operations um, and efforts as we see other pre-existing properties continue to trade uh, like the demand and use on um, 
short-term rentals in the way that that money is generated by demand and use on the island. This is also a transfer on residential real estate and is not an increased tax. That's a reason that I favor this. Um, it's also the direction that the state house pointed um, us a number of times when we bring the housing bank bill, look for an existing revenue source. Um, you know, it is a you know, borrow from Peter to pay Paul kind of situation, which never feels good in any political environment and is not easy. Again, I can't shout loud enough how much I support everything that the land bank does. I use it on a daily basis. Um, but how do we find um, effective ways to work together? And if this funding is one um, or it's existing land, um, so I, I would personally like to see this revenue source, but I'd like to see it one that was uh, one supported by the community as a whole. Um, I do believe the way that the short-term rental tax was written to Christie's point, it was written with the intent of affordable housing. So it's easy for me to follow that line, um, but man, I would have loved to have had $12 million for us to direct spending last year. Um, or, or from the, the 2020 calendar year. So um, that's my personal opinion. Um, I'm, if there's no more public comment before I look for, I, excuse me, mo no more board comment before I look for a motion, I'll come to general public. I see Mr. Dickler has his hand raised. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's lots of ways to look at this. Um, nobody denies that the land bank does an important job here on Nantucket, not as important as it was when we needed to protect vast amounts of open space, but important nevertheless. But to me, it comes down to a question of priorities. And when I look at it, I look at the last few million of the land bank fee every year. So let's just take a typical year, not this last year with its 37 million, but in the five years before that, it averaged five, uh, 20 million. So let's say that the last millions are 5 million if you take one quarter of that. So that gives the land bank 15 million. Their average uh, expenditures to improve their properties and administrative expenses is 3 million a year. That would give them 12 million, even without an exceptional year. So what about the last 5 million? Now it's a question of priorities. Do you want to take that last 5 million and through a combination of uh, mortgage assistance and eventually a land trust to develop new properties to replace those that have been taken off the market? To me, you can house 20 families permanently for every 5 million versus what can you do with the 5 million in terms of coastal resilience? You can buy a waterfront property that will succumb to the ocean no matter what you do. To me, that's an easy choice. Protect the families more than a house. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dickler. Um, Megan, I never saw your hand go down from the last article, but based on experience, I'm assuming you want to share on this one. Absolutely. Oh, sorry. So, uh, uh, to Megan first, Henry, I'll come back to you. Go ahead, Megan. Yep, yep, you're correct, Brian. Um, so as someone who grew up here and is not able to be a homeowner, I'm very much against this article. Um, and, and I think I'm hoping this board, and maybe you can answer this, or this, the trust read the letter I originally sent on December 6th to the trust, the select board in the land bank. It Do was... You, Yes, it was, it was read by all members of, it, of the board individually. Okay, so I don't need to bore you with all the other things the land bank does um, aside from walking trails and conservation because I think this article is forgetting all the positives that the land bank funds provide to the community, which would be a, a great loss if they did not have the funding available to do that. Additionally, just like this trust wants to be nimble in the market, the land bank does too. So why take away the funding from them to give to affordable housing trust when they might be supporting coastal resiliency or playgrounds for children, something like that. I, I just think that this is the wrong way to try to find funding. And there's 
now so many other articles that the trust should be supporting to fund the trust versus taking it from another group. That's it, thank you. Great, thank you, Megan. Um, Mr. Sanford, you previously had your hand up. Did you wanna speak on this one? No, that's all right. Everyone said everything I was gonna comment on. I, I, my only comment would be from an outsider looking in, you guys just discussed Article 38 and how um, maybe it's not two thirds you know, maybe it's less, but you should look at it deeper. I would only encourage you to maybe do the same here because the funding is so uh, significant and steady that maybe it's less than what they're asking for. Maybe there's a gray area. Um, and to only look also that this is not a novel idea. Um, I, I don't particularly like um, going against conservation efforts just because it's uh, Un unsustainable politically, it seems on Nantucket, but I applaud those who are trying to have the conversation. Um, this is not a new idea. Uh, it's not a novel idea. They in fact have done it um, at several land banks across Massachusetts already. So I might just, ask, you know, particularly um, Martha's Vineyard with the Island Housing Trust, you might just look at how they were able to attain both open space programs and children's parks programs and coastal resiliency programs and also use funding for affordable housing. That is all I ask. I don't, I don't want to, I'm not in favor one way or another. I just, I think it's akin, you know, you're all your points, all your board members points are akin to what you just discussed in article 38. So maybe take that approach of like, well, if it's not a half a percent, then maybe it's 10 basis points. I don't know <clears throat> because every dollar counts, I guess. Great. Thank you, Henry. Are there any other members of the general public? Seeing no activity on my screen, um, I'm gonna come back. I, uh, does any final comments from the board? Otherwise I'll look to Rima for a motion. Seeing none, Rima, Mike Cures. Um, I uh, make a motion that the trust supports this article. Article uh, nine. Is there a second? Second, it's Allison. Second from Allison, any discussion? Seeing none, a vote by roll call, Penny Dye. I'm gonna be the outlier, May. Christy Ferrantella. No. Rima Sherry. Aye. Allison Mitchell. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. And Brian Sullivan's an aye. All right, great. Thank Wait, you, hold guys. On, hold on. Did Christy say nay? Christy said nay. Penny, so we have two nays. Um, so you Penny, get the motion passes. Christy, the motion passes three to two with one of um, recusal. Four to, no, four to two. Allison Rima. Oh, I wasn't counting myself. Sorry. Yes, four <laughs> to two. Okay, so. Um, before I leave the meeting, I just want to come back to a comment that Christy made because um, I'm going to recuse on Article 90. Um, Christy made a point about in our notes or comments, is there an order or positioning or just is it the vote like in this sense that we want to pass on to FinCom um, about, I'll say the level of energy behind each of the articles and our positions on them. Do we want to expand more on the vote than the votes themselves in commentary or? Um, Penny? I think that some of us should be participating in the FinCom meetings. I mean, Brooke okay. is going, but so are you, were, you, were you gonna be able to participate? So I will participate in the four funding articles, but not the- That's what I meant. Um, yeah, not Article 90. And just for clarification, we're going to leave the meeting on Article 90 because we work in the real estate business? Correct. I've, I've been advised um, because my primary income um, is directly related to short-term rental tax, I should. Okay, so that that's fine. I'm comfortable with that, but that doesn't preclude me from speaking out otherwise when I'm not on this committee. Correct. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I think Penny's at 
So did, did anybody want to add any thoughts about what we're going to present to FinCom other than just the conversation, the meeting? We've posted both meetings so all members can be there. If we hit a quorum, we'll call a meeting. Um, okay, so I think we're good there. So on that note, I'll turn the meeting over to Brooke. Um, I'm going to recuse and pass it to you. Thanks, Brian. So um, the the last article we have on the agenda to address today is our uh, is Article 90, which is um, which has been proposed by officially is it uh, by Tobias Glidden and. Um, and I, I, I'm going to ask if uh, I'm not going to obviously I'm not going to read this. So um, I, I would ask that Julia Lindner from Act Now, um, if if you'd like Julia to do a quick summary of the article um, for us. Again, I know you have been in the meeting, but we have some members of the public who haven't um, been present at those meetings. Is that um, make sense, Julia? She's not there. Okay. So uh, not hearing anything from Julia, um, I think what I will do is do my best to- She is here. Uh, she is here, hold on. Yes, I know, but she's not- She must have stepped away from her desk. Yep, she's probably stepped away. So yeah, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it open for her to pop in. Um, and um, what, my understanding is that what is being proposed are rest restrictions on short-term rentals. Um, that um, uh, that include limits on the number of days uh, to be rented, and there's uh, a difference between residential premises and uh, residential uh, properties where the residents live there, our Nantucket residents, and live there and rent, and those that are um, occupied by non-residents, owned and, and not occupied. And so I, I'm not an expert on this. So um, I would just ask if the board has any comments um, on this, any thoughts or comments from board members. Allison. Thank you. Um... Madam Chair, uh, I am, you know, this is obviously a, a hot topic on Nantucket right now. Um, and I, I will admit when then when the article first came out um, upon its face, I was very excited because I will say very plainly that I am always of the opinion that um, I would like homes to be available to be bought for people to live in all the time. Um, and I don't like the idea of businesses or homes becoming businesses, even though I know those are people's businesses. Um, but I think that our housing crisis is important enough that for me, my priority is that homes should be housing Islanders. That being said, um, I am not entirely sure that this article is the unicorn that would get us to um, a culture where homes are prioritized for year-round islanders. Um, in the future, I would love to see something that was specific to that and didn't pull in um, kind of a lot of other gray areas that don't necessarily um, revolve around affordable housing. So that's my personal opinion on this particular article. I don't really have a, a yay or a nay, but that's how I feel. Thanks, Allison. Uh, Dave? Uh, you know, very similar to what Allison said, I think in the beginning, I mean, I, I think that it's undeniable that it's a problem. Um, but I, I think that uh, for many reasons, this article just, I think um, it's very confusing. It's very complex. Um, I think to, to think that any of those houses will ever return back to the to the year round rental community. I think that um, I, I, I really have a hard time being convinced that even a small percentage would ever return back because of the money that's been invested in it, really. Um, so I mean, those, those are just my concerns. My other concern is where this article would take 
away things from people. And I'm not talking about the corporate rental business, but individuals, this will take things away from them. I mean, they, they've based financial decisions on this. It is a luxury they've enjoyed doing for years. And for us to come in and say, no, I just don't think is right. So I, I support this in principle. I just don't think this is the article that we need right now. Thanks, Dave. Anybody else from the board? Rima. Um, I don't think this really affects us directly. Um, you know, it's sort of big picture. It's, its intention is to help uh, year-round uh, uh, residents by, you know, discouraging this kind of investment. And I understand that. I agree with that. But because it doesn't, it mentions affordable housing, but it really doesn't have any direct um, impact. And so, you know, my feeling is that we don't take any action um, uh, as far as um, recommending or not recommending this article. That, that's Thanks, my Rima. opinion. Uh, anybody else from the board? Christy. Thank you. Um, I'll just agree with what, what's already been said. I think Rima's right that we shouldn't take um, a position on this. It's It's been mentioned that it's meant to support affordable housing and it's definitely started a very large conversation about that in the community, which I think has really helped the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, but I agree with Dave that a lot of these houses, um, you know, realistically aren't going to return to year-round houses. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see how this might be changed up at the FinCom meeting or on the floor of town meeting, whether we want to grandfather some um, some rentals into uh, the policy or you know what changes might come to effect. Um, another big concern I have is you know what we just voted on earlier is if we're supporting short-term rental tax going to affordable housing, then supporting limits on short-term rentals uh, would limit the funding for affordable housing. So. I know that's a tr tricky, slippery slope of uh, supporting that as a funding situation, um, but just something to think about as we talk about this article. So um, I will weigh in a little bit here. I think I've heard from everybody on the board. So um, uh, m my concern is about unintended consequences of this and by, by shrinking what exists, for people in terms of revenue, whether that's a family that's been able to own their seasonal home only because they've been able to rent short term or a year round family that's only been able to um, manage their mortgage by renting their secondary dwelling or for you know as many days as they can during the year. Um, my concern is taking away or, or negatively impacting the financial choices that people made in the past I would be much more interested in an article that crafts some kind of um, grandfathering, as Christy said, of everything that exists, issuing short-term rental permits and then having a pool of short-term rental per permits that is limited in some way and, and regulated in some way. Um, so we're, we're, so as people buy into the market here going forward, they know what they're buying into as opposed to imposing something retroactively upon them. And um, I mean, I feel the same way and I'll just, I'll, I'll, it's sort of somewhat connected to this. I, I do believe that there's room for a, a much, robust, much more robust conversation about zoning and how zoning impacts affordable housing and how it could po more positively affect affordable housing. And I think there's room for a pretty big conversation after this year's town meeting for comprehensive bylaw and zoning analysis with regard to affordable housing, which I would think this could be, this idea could be a part of for maybe a future town meeting. So that's, that's my thoughts on the subject. Brooke, Henry Sanford has his hand up. I don't know if he wants to talk. Uh, yeah, and I think I muted myself. Henry, you ready? 
I I am ready. Uh, right. Hold on. I just put my daughter down. Hopefully she'll stay asleep. I suspected that was the case. Okay. <laughs> uh, hold on, guys. Sorry. <laughs> We've been there. <laughs> any other any other comments from the board? What? I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was that was not intentional. I, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, look, um, everyone who's been reading social media knows where I am in this conversation. But, you know, one thing I've really been meditating on in the past couple of days is I, I am thankful for Act Now for crystallizing the moment. I mean, I don't agree with the methods because people I've been talking to um, are frightened uh, you know, especially locals who use short-term rentals as kind of like a tool in their attainability toolkit. Um, I deal with a significant amount of first-time home buyers and somehow leveraging the rental value of their property is always part of the conversation on how they're going to pay their mortgage. So I think that that is kind of where it's like, you've really got to dive deeper into what the needs are um, versus kind of like the broad brush. I think most people, as you guys have identified, will, you know, would be okay with some sort of short-term rental regulation. And I think a lot of short-term rental owners would probably not be against it either. Um, I think the thing that we need, and I really invite you guys to have this discussion further. Um, one thing that I do is I do actually manage a portfolio of vacation rentals for the corporate investor as, as, as defined. I mean, it's, it's a single man <laughs> who, who owns properties on Nantucket and, um, has made it kind of his second career buying up properties and renting them out. Um, I can tell you that they're not the huge business that everyone thinks they are. These are primarily investments as a store of wealth. Um, I can also tell you, and I'm again, I'm happy to open up spreadsheets and show you guys the budgets that we work with. A minimum of 30% of the gross lease value of these rentals is directly gone back into the overhead in the local service economy. So I'm not saying that I, in no way don't kill the goose with the golden egg and none of that. I just think we should further define the economic impact of these things before we just wholesale, you know, make kind of a, a, a catchy statement that corporations are, you know, robbing the middle class. Because I think, honestly, a lot of the middle class in Nantucket are employed by these people. Um, I've seen the difference in, you know, how these people like... I don't know. I guess, I guess what I'm saying is that these are members of our community who support our businesses and we shouldn't be painting them with kind of a informal broad brush. Now, yes, I am sure there are a few people who have no connection to Nantucket and maybe own a rental here, but that is extremely, extremely rare. Most of these people who do the quote unquote rental investment are at one stage. So like, who is your, your, your investor who doesn't use the house ever now they morph, right? So like they start off um, as someone who buys a house and has to rent it full time because they still have a career and they don't have time to take off. They might come down here April or October. Um, but as time goes on, they then turn that into a second home. And some of those people even further turn it into their primary residence. So I just want to say that like the, the definition of investor is I think ambiguous. Um, and I think, you know, is not always correct in that people change and people take different roles in their relationship with Nantucket. Um, the other thing I would say too, is that this creates a pretty large enforcement burden on the town. And we all, you guys just all discussed, like, how do you cut up that two thirds in article 38? Right. So like, this is just going to create another need. Um, but also if it's, you know, the, the, the moment has been crystallized, right? So now more than ever, more than I've ever, experienced the second homeowners are actually concerned about affordable housing i mean that's amazing to me um they're finally connecting the dots that their quality of life and our quality of life are connected um which is really really great and we can thank mr glidden and act now for kind of uh, making that apparent but if we if this is passed you will lose that moment and all those people will say you just took away from me to help you, even though we can't vote in your town meeting and we represent 80% of your tax base. And that will disenfranchise them. And now you've created an opponent in, in, the, in the whole thing. So I think framing this around affordable housing 
is precarious, um, especially considering it's more of like a high level experiment than it really is a direct funding resource. Um, I think it's it's very, very risky in the unattended consequences. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Henry. Julia, I saw you unmuted. Did you want to speak? Sure, sorry about that. I had to step off a little bit. Um, sure. So I think that most of you at this point are pretty well educated on uh, why Act Now uh, proposed the bylaw in the first place. And I think that the research, you know, I have to go back to like the early days of the research. And what we learned was that there was a direct link with housing. And that's why we took it on uh, the way that we did um, so directly. Um, if it had been simply an issue of neighbors not wanting these businesses in their backyard, we would not be here today with this article. And we strongly believe that it's not as much about looking in the rear view mirror. It's a, it's a lot about preserving or protecting the year round housing that we have, the little that we do have. And in the context of the Affordable Housing Trust and your efforts in trying to create affordable housing, I think that you have, you all have a clear vested interest in preserving you know, the year round housing, whether it's affordable or, or not, right? Um, there are all, all sorts of different levels of, of year round housing, obviously. So to, um, you know, it, for, for us, it's certainly not an affordable housing issue. It's a year round housing issue. And uh, there are other impacts, obviously, that you've, I've already discussed with you. And I think that in the context of your supporting Article 38, um, you know, it would be great that at the same time, you also acknowledge that there is a link and you're right. And that we need to address going forward the impact that it has on uh, the housing stock. It's a general bylaw. It's not something that can't be altered. It's really hard to get things perfect the first time, as you all know, with these kinds of, with any bylaw. Um, there are three months to town meeting. We're still open to, you know, we're still, we're not oblivious to the pushback that, that the article is getting. And we're open to um, figuring out how to make, make something work for the community. Um, enforcement is not, you know, so we are not the first community to go down this path. Many, many, many other communities have gone down this path before us. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I was reading about um, the S San Juan Islands, 1997 is when they put in short-term rental regulation. I, you know, that's the earliest I'd ever seen. Um, what it's about is um, starting, hopefully starting this conversation and going and going to a place where the community can land for town meeting. And we really hope that the Affordable Housing Trust can help us get us, th get us there. If I may ask a question, Julia, um, what is the process for amending or offering amendments to the article? I'm, I'm honestly curious about between now and town meeting as the sponsor. As the sponsor, um, I believe Tobias has sort of the first right to suggest anything on town meeting floor. And that could even be, you know, I think that would go for, you know, whether you're tabling or whether you're, you know, there are all sorts of different considerations that a sponsor could um, could suggest a town meeting, but that's my understanding. If anyone has other information, that's the. So I guess my question to you guys is if you were, if you were planning on offering amendments um, before town meeting, would you let the community, I mean, are you planning to let the community know in advance of town meeting of, of changes you might offer in response to feedback? Yes. Okay. That it doesn't, yes. We're already discussing that, yes. Okay, great, thanks. More of a process question. Does anyone else from the board have anything that they wanna say or, or add? 
to the conversation? Any from anyone from the public have anything they want to say or add? Oh, did we lose Brooke? Brooke, are you frozen? You look frozen. Hit refresh. Yeah, she is frozen. Okay. <laughs> okay, hold on. She's trying to get back in. No, that's act smart. Hmm. Hold on. Brooke, you need to maybe log off and log back in quickly. Okay, let's give her a second. Oh, Brian's back. So I have nothing to comment on the current conversation, but I think that there was a, a, a take no action move past. No, nothing's actually happened yet because Brooke is in limbo. Okay. But Here she goes. I'm going to let her back in. Hold on. She's in Zoom limbo. Zumbo. Uh, my apologies. Um, my internet on my computer just shut itself off. I have no idea what happened. It's bad everywhere. Uh, it's something, there's something going on. Something's going on. Okay, so let me turn my camera back on. Okay, so I don't know where I was, but next Tuesday we have a meeting that will be primarily regarding, uh, we'll be with the HPP consultants, and then we will have our regular meeting on March 16th at 1 p.m., Tuesday, March 16th, so two Wait, weeks in a row. Did we yep. take a make a motion about this? I didn't hear a vote taken on this article no uh is there i heard nothing i asked for board comment is there any action that the board wants to take on the last item up for discussion hearing none we will leave it as a discussion item um who is act smart exactly please that's probably tobias glidden oh sorry i'll change it thank you okay um Okay, so, um, so that's a no action then. Okay. Yep. And is there any public comment on anything that is not on the agenda? Okay, hearing none, any board comments? All right, anybody want to offer a motion to adjourn? Uh, wait, wait. Brian, you're back. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but Christy and Megan both, I think Megan had her hand up in public and Christy had board. Oh, I missed it. I, my apologies. Okay, so I'll go back to public. Megan? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, unrelated to anything on your agenda, but related to housing, um, NCTV 18 will be airing the uh, Surfside Crossing versus Town of Nantucket hearing on Thursday, they'll be airing it live on NCTV and also on YouTube. Um, and I think that might be of something to consider just because you guys are housing advocates of some sort. Um, and that just came out yesterday afternoon. Great, okay. thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thanks. Christy. I was just gonna ask if we need to make a motion to have Brooke put together our recommendations for the FinCom and to also offer to help Brooke in any capacity that she needs. I think that's a great motion. Um, is okay. there a second? Uh, second by Rima, Cherry. Um, any discussion on it? Brooke, do you need resources? No, I just think that there that it's going to be a, a bit of an awkward moment because we we took action on an article for which I'm a sponsor. So, so, so I'll, we're gonna I'll, need, I'm gonna need some help from you. Well, oh, absolutely, during the presentation, no question. Um, but okay. in, a, in a presentation material to be delivered, I think is what Christy's requesting, a, a kind of a written document. So, I got it. Great. Um, so we have a, a motion and a second from Rima Sherry by roll call, Christy Ferrantella. Aye. Rima Sherry. Aye. Brooke Moore. Aye. Allison Mitchell. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. 
Brian Sullivan is an I. Jump back to my agenda. Um, Brooke was mentioning the next meetings, other business um, on the 9th. And this is an open invitation to everyone to participate. The consultants who are helping us work through the housing production plan, which is the next five year strategic plan for affordable housing on Nantucket, will be working through the meeting on March 9th. Um, that uh, is Jen Golson. Um, and if anybody needs information prior to that meeting, please um, reach out to Tucker, Eleanor, um, and we can work on getting you what you need. Uh, following that meeting, the regularly scheduled is Tuesday, March 16th. Um, and kind of jumping out of order there, coming to item number eight, which is adjournment. I'll look for a motion. So moved. Uh, moved by Brooke, second by? Christy. Christy. Uh, by roll call, Christy Ferrantella. Aye. Uh, Rima Sherry. Aye. Allison Mitchell. Aye. Um, Dave Iverson. Aye, if you can hear me. We got gotcha. you. I'm clear. And I think Brian Sullivan, the board's moving so fast I can't track where it is. Brian Sullivan's an aye. I think that's everybody who's on. Great. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thanks to the public for coming.